I, I, I came up with the idea of penile coma because it's well known that, well, I don't know if it's well known here, but, but it's, it's, generally, it's generally thought to be that prisons are criminogenic, that, you, that they, they're great makers of better criminals, than that if you, go into a, if you go into a prison for having hot-wired a Volkswagen Golf, you will graduate from the prison having learned how to hot-wire a Mercedes. You do your post-grad training in there. And um, one of the ways of short-circuiting that kind of knowledge transfer would be to put people in a coma and that. And that it was, I don't think the sums would, the sum, I, I think I read somewhere as well that the sums of keep, keeping someone in a coma or to keeping someone in a prison, that it's actually quite, that there are certain cost benefits to it. Yeah. In my first two books, there was kind of a, a high mortality rate and an increasing mortality rate. So in my third book, I said, I'm going to start with a dead man and resurrect him. And, and this is what happens in this. JJ, contrary to what, although he's on every page of the book, he's not in the book. It's just people reporting how he was and everything like that. He's kind of the absent presence, the absent heart of the book and that. And it is the, the job of these five people around him, his neighbor, his father, his lover, teacher, politician, they talk about him and they more or less talk him back to life or talk him back into our hearts and our minds and that. The book is actually a hymn to fatherhood, neighborliness and community, all those kind of, all those warm human things. It's very much, it's very much a, a, a hymn to the rhythms and the, and the, and the concerns and the interactions that, that go between neighbors, family, community, and everything like that. And that's why there's an awful, there's a, a dwelling upon uh, funerals and christenings and um, sing songs in pubs and things like that. Because these are some of the occasions that draw, some of the occasions that draw rural communities and small village communities together in Ireland. And um, so, yeah, that 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 kind of that kind of community concern within a cyborg. Yeah, <laughs> I come from Lewisburg, which is a small town in West Mayo, and I uh, I just live right outside it, and there's nothing around me but green fields and, and that. And uh, so, the book is set around there, and the, in, and the. It's, it, uh, the, the central location of the book is, is on a pr prison ship in the Killary Harbour. And the Killary Harbour is just 10, 15 miles up the road from, from, uh, from Lewisburg and, it has, uh, and it has, it's, the, it's the only natural, natural fjord on, on, the, on the coastline of Ireland and that. So it's this kind of natural incarceration and that. So that's where I located the, located the put, where I put my prison ship. <laughs> My, my, my first book was was uh, my first book was called Getting It in the Head. That was a book a book of short stories, and that was a, a book which which uh, it was aimed pretty squarely at your head. Um, it didn't it made no it was about ideas. It was about imaginative obsession, uh, and about dangerous ideas, and it really made no play for your heart. It really wasn't it really wasn't too interested in in making uh, in making many inroads in that. And my second book then, which, uh, which was uh, uh, Crow's Requiem, and that was a ki kind of a fairy tale which appealed to the heart, uh, uh, almost to the exclusion of everything going on in the mind. Um, that, was, uh, that was my second book. So in my third book, I, uh, I thought I would like to bring head and heart together in Notes from a Coma. So that was part of what I tried to do with Notes from a Coma. But I also tried to weld several disparate things together in, in, in this novel, I suppose. One of them was the, the, the tradition of Irish um, domestic realism, on the one hand, and then there's the tradition of kind of, kind of paranoid SF that, that is more recognizable from, I suppose, J.G. Ballard and, and Philip K. Dick and everything. And I tried to weld those two things together uh, and um, see what sort of love child would would uh, would um, uh, would eventuate from the, this marriage of these two separate genres and that, because I um, because I, I I 
because I am fond of both of those types of writing. I love both of those. Um, and I'm as, I will as easily sit down and read science fiction as I will read, um, you know, the likes of John McGahren or something, or, 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 uh, or uh, uh, William Trevor or someone like that. It's a single image that, 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 uh, that drew me to Romania. The 1976 Olympics, Nadia Comaneci scoring perfect tens. What did she get? Four perfect tens or something like that? And rightly or wrongly, I made the leap that any country which gave us Nadia Comaneci had to be a wonderful place. So I, I, um, I extrapolated from that, 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 that this wonderful place, and then I began reading about it and found that it was anything but a wonderful place, that it was quite a terrible place and a very, a very difficult place in which to be human uh, and that. Even, even, though, even though Romania was potentially a, a wonderful place, it had so much natural things going for it and everything. And I, I uh, so when the 1989 revolutions came along then, I was very, re we remember that they all happened peacefully, almost one by one. But re they all happened peacefully, one by one, except Romania, which was the very last one. And Romania was, um, Romania was very, very dramatic and bloody and sudden when it did happen and that even though it was slow to happen but it was sudden when it did happen and it happened Christmas Day I think if I remember correctly that, that Ceausescu was, 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 was t executed and uh, then and because of that then the, in the month after that the, the Romanian orphanages were opened up on that and, and that was the point at which I, I, I found out that something like the American State Department calculated that 10,000 children left Romania in the aftermath of the Russian Revo or, or, or the aftermath of the Romanian Revolution, and this is that there was very little documentation on an awful lot of these children, and I often wondered what happened to them, where they went, how did they leave, and really that was it. That that's the starting point. So from Nadia Comaneci, right up to the the 1989 revolutions, I always had an eye out for. Romania, so that's how it happened. I think it's one of the things that I'm, that I'm grateful for, is that I'm the oldest of my family, and um, so I had no guidance. So I read willy-nilly. I, I read here, there, and everywhere. So one day I was reading Dostoevsky, and the next day I was reading Isaac Asimov, and the next day I was reading Flann O'Brien. So it didn't, none of that, so my, my, and I suppose my mind to this day is kind of, is, is a mosaic rather than a, rather than something that is continuous. It's bits and pieces and, and uh, shards and fragments. And I think that goes into the structure of, of notes from a coma. It is notes from a coma. It's not continuous linear narrative from a coma. So, uh, so I think that, I think that, that I think my own kind of imaginative makeup went into the structure of the book and that. When I graduated from kids re reading, when I read Enid Blyton and all that sort of thing when I was a kid, around the age of nine or ten or eleven, I very quickly began reading westerns and they had a huge influence on me. Um, they, they, um, people like, like um, there was a time in my life now when I, as, right up to my late teens, when I was, when I was Mentally, I was, I would have been, if I'd been dropped in the Mojave Desert, I would have been confident of making my way out of it because of my reading of, of Louis L'Amour. How do I pronounce it? Louis L'Amour? Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, I would have been confident of making my way out of it because I'd read so much of him and that. And, but then, yes, I did graduate onto, uh, onto the, the, the European masters as, as it's put. During the, uh, the Celtic Tiger, I'm familiar with the idea, I don't, I don't know if you are familiar with the idea, but the, we, we refer to an economic boom we had between, between 95 and 2008. We, we, refer, we refer to that as the Celtic Tiger. And, and um, the literature of that, it was really strange because, because during, that, during that era, we had, um, we had things like The Economist magazine coming in and telling us that you're the most globalized country in the world. You, 
you reach out, you, you welcome in and you reach out and you meet all these indicators that show that you're the most globalized country in the world. And against that, you had, we had actually had a literature at, at the time that was, I thought, was incredibly inward looking. Uh, we, we started writing historical novels and biography and our theater defaulted to, our theater defaulted to, uh, to monologues and that. So at a time when we could have become, at a time when we could have become speculative and conjectural about the world, we actually became curatorial. It's really, I, I don't know why that, that was, uh, whether it was because of the politics or because, or the culture dictated the politics of that. I don't know which way the causal relationship ran or what it was, but there was definitely this period in our, li in our life where we were e economically, we were we were reaching out all over the world. Like we were the biggest exporters of software or something in the world. Um, but our literature was, I thought at the time, was some of the most inward looking, that uh, w was for, was about as inward looking as we, we have ever been. And um, so we're still getting out of that period and it remains to be seen how we, how we do that, whether we're going to become, embrace the world and be nice to see us recover. Maybe this would be a time when we would recover our experimental tradition. We, we, we are the great experimental writers. We, Joyce and Beckett and Flann O'Brien and that, and it would be, it would be good and proper to see a return to that kind of recklessness and generosity of mind and spirit that governed those great writers.